Il Museo Nazionale Romano è lieto, molto lieto, di partecipare alla grande mostra organizzata dal British Museum Nerone, l'uomo dietro al mito. È una grande sfida per il British Museum aver proposto questa mostra perché Nerone è una delle figure più complesse dell'antichità. Si conosce il Nerone, il mostro, insomma, che secondo la leggenda cantava davanti alla città che bruciava, che aveva ucciso la madre e le due moli. Ma ovviamente questo è anche il mito di Nerone. Nerone è eh, un, una personalità storica importante e si sa dagli autori antichi più autorevoli come eh, Tacito che Nerone, tra l'altro durante l'incendio di Roma, non era neanche a Roma, era nella sua villa di Anzio e eh, qua tra l'altro abbiamo delle opere che provengono da, da questa villa imperiale eccezionale e opere molto belle come la, la fanciulla che si trova dietro di me. Al Museo Nazionale Romano Nerone è presente un po' dappertutto, eh, presente qua in questa sala dei capolavori della scultura, perché ci sono appunto eh, diversi eh, capolavori che provengono dalla sua villa imperiale a, a, ad Anzio e pure a Subiaco, come la, la fanciulla d'Anzio, il, di, il fanciullo di, di Subiaco, ma si trova anche alle terme di Diocleziano, nell'aula più importante aperta in, aperta in questo momento, che è l'aula eh, undicesima, dove c'è un grande mosaico che proviene da, dalla stessa eh, villa imperiale di Anzio e soprattutto, direi storicamente, forse il documento più importante è presente negli atti degli Arvali, nel chiostro piccolo delle terme di Diocleziano, dove diverse iscrizioni, che tra l'altro sono a danni consecutivi, riguardano il regno di Nerone e le vicende di, di questo regno importante. E quindi per noi è un privilegio partecipare come con dei prestiti eccezionali, ma anche con una partecipazione ad altre attività del British Museum, eh, attività in remoto, come si fa adesso eh, da, dalla, dalla crisi, dalla pandemia, ma è anche un bene per quanto ci riguarda, perché abbiamo potuto stringere un, un vero partnership con, con il British Museum e, e quindi cominceremo questa collaborazione eh, particolare, privilegiata, con delle attività eh, online eh, sui nostri social e eh, sul sito del Museo Nazionale Romano. E quindi non vedo l'ora, per quanto mi riguarda, di eh, visitare questa mostra e, e capire come i nostri colleghi del British intendono eh, chiarire tutta questa situazione storica veramente importante e complicata di, del Regno di Nerone, e quindi do la parola ai colleghi del British Museum. Good evening, everybody. What a total pleasure it is to see you tonight. Many, many old friends and many new. Uh, we have close on 2,000 people with us so far this evening uh, from over 40 countries. So what a delight that even through the terrible events of this year, uh, people are still fascinated by history and need to learn more and understand more. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly. I'm Bethany Hughes, um, a great supporter of all explorations into the ancient world. Uh, but tonight, our star turns are the curators of the exhibition, uh, Torsten Opper and Francesca Bologna. Now, Torsten and Francesca are going to give you a very brief a summary. Uh, it's been described as a narrative overview or a whistle-stop tour of the exhibition and of Nero's reign. There is going to be plenty of time to ask questions and in fact 
even before we went live tonight, the questions were coming into the chat box. So I think we're going to have um, a Socratic dialogue at the end of the presentation uh, and share ideas together. So I would just like to welcome Torsten is going to start us off. So Torsten and Francesca, the curators of the exhibition, uh, please share what you'd like uh, just as, as your as your brief summary of this extraordinary man. Uh, this man who's commanded such extraordinary history and has also generated such remarkable myths and legends. Over to you, Torsten. Uh, thank you so much, Bethany, and um, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, before I start, let me just take this opportunity to thank our colleagues in Rome and indeed throughout the UK and Europe. Uh, as you all experienced it, this was a difficult year and, and without our collaboration and these loans, the exhibition couldn't have happened. Uh, I hope our colleagues feel we've done them justice and they're, they're great objects justice. About two thirds of the 220 or so objects are loans. Um, great things, many not seen in the UK before. Um, if we could have the first slide, please. So Nero is one of the most famous Roman emperors and he's the most infamous. If you like alliterations, he is a matricide, he's a megalomaniac, he's a monster, he's the archetypal tyrant a gluttonous, profligate, uh, deluded artist, what have you. Now, now all these stereotypes that um, we're probably all familiar with, and you see them uh, here in the, in the, on the slide, a film still from 1951 from Covardis, um, they're all based on a very narrow range of literary sources, um, written by members of the Roman elite, mostly senatorial in background. Um, so that's all we have, people like Tacitus, Suetonius, Cassius Dio, they give us this uh, narrative backdrop. Um, and that really has shaped Nero's legacy for two millennia now. It's rarely been challenged. Uh, it's a massive legacy. These sources, however, also give us hints of a different tradition. We know that after Nero's death, even though allegedly he was such a crazy person, he was hated, the plebs, the common people in Rome, deposited flowers on his tomb. We know that over the next two or three decades, um, especially in the Greek East, there were imposters, people who pretended to be Nero and gathered mass followings. So there's a weird contrast between the things we're told. Hated by the elite, apparently quite loved and popular with the common people. That's something we want to explore in the exhibition. It's not about rehabilitating Nero, but seeing why we're told certain things about him uh, and not others. There's the film still with Peter Ustinov, literally uh, on the roof of his palace, as the saying goes, fiddling while Rome burns, so playing the liar. Uh, among the many things, but barely a crime he hasn't been uh, accused of, Nero. Killed his mother, with whom he's allegedly had a, a, an incestuous relationship, killed his first two wives. Um, burned down Rome on purpose to build this magnificent palace and uh, a weird deranged performer. The object on the left uh, really encapsulates that. It was very famous from the um, 17th century on when it's first documented uh, and is now linked to Nero's Wikipedia entry. So again, the, if you Google Nero, that's the image you'll see. And you can recognize that only a small part of the face uh, is ancient. You see it in, in the sort of dark honey color there, the forehead and eyes. That was a portrait of Nero recarved later. Everything else is a restoration. Brilliant technically and well informed by the antiquarian sources. So it's really uh, a 3D expression of what we can find in the ancient literary record. He's a sneering tyrant. He, he looks fat and evil and mean. And as we could, in a way, deconstruct this particular sculpture, so we can explore and deconstruct the myth of Nero. If you want a quick soundbite, it's 2000 years of lies and manipulations, potentially politically motivated, a distorted view of Nero that we can balance in the exhibition with other objects that give us a contrasting point of view. So if you have the next slide, please. So you just saw Nero the monster in this later caricature version. The, the first object in the exhibition is this statue of Nero as a boy. And we can date it quite precisely. It's now in the Louvre, comes from, in, from Rome or, or near Rome. Um, it shows Nero as a 12 or 13 year old. His mother Agrippina 
had just married the reigning emperor Claudius uh, in AD 49. A year later, Nero was adopted by Claudius as crown prince. He, he was born Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus into a family closely related to the ruling Julio Claudians. So here is this little innocent looking boy. Four years later, he was ruler of the Roman world. And age 30, he was dead. So there's a lot in a short life. Um, the statue is, is really fascinating. It's one of the very few images of Nero that have survived. He looks quite innocent. Our idea behind the exhibition was to start at the beginning, as it were, leave the legacy aside uh, and follow Nero through his life in, in real time, in inverted commas. Things could have developed differently. Nothing was predetermined. And I, I think that's what we want to do. There's also the map of the Roman Empire, and you see this huge, vast extent. It had grown through military expansion uh, over the preceding centuries. There was a savage civil war at the end of the Republic, and then Augustus, the first emperor, came to power, and there was a period of peace. And that brought prosperity, uh, economic growth, uh, and social mobility for many. There were many people from the leading people from the provinces who wanted to have a say in the Senate in Rome. Um, there were former slaves who became extremely wealthy. So a social dynamic, there's a lot of social aspiration, but that leads to conflict as well. Social, it's a zero sums game in the minds of the elite. Social aspiration of the masses leads to social, to status anxiety among the elite. And that, that is the background music to Nero's reign, if you like. There's also on the map, the Parthian Empire, um, conflict, and then collaborations with the Parthians, uh, the big rival power that uh, dominate much of Nero's reign. So you have the contrasting things. You have the Parthians, big geopolitics, and up in the Northwest, you have Britain uh, with the Boudicca rebellion. And that gives us uh, a nice detailed picture of the reality of Roman imperialism. Next slide, please. So Nero and the family of Augustus. Nero was the great great grandson of Augustus, uh, the first princeps. And you know, we often we call him emperor, which is you know a complicated term, maybe not quite accurate. He, technically, he's the first man, uh, first among equals. Um, a winner of the civil war, he establishes a new form of government, the principate, and he declares that essentially a restoration of the old republic. But in reality, it's a monarchy in disguise. That means all the senators are still there and they hold their offices and so on. Um, but the court becomes increasingly important. But the court, the officials are different. They're often members of the imperial household, former slaves and so on. So there's a lot of tension there. And the Principate is a constantly evolving improvisation. So there are no clear rules for the succession. Um, Every transition of power between members of the Julio-Claudian family, so the family of Augustus, is troubled. Um, when Augustus dies, aged 76, his stepson Tiberius takes over, who spends then the last 10 years of his reign uh, almost in self-imposed exile on Capri because he's, he's fed up with the Senate. His successor Caligula is assassinated and Claudius comes into power um, and there's constant conflict with the Senate as well there. So we mustn't look at Nero in isolation. What happens to Nero has happened to many of his predecessors. For these early principes, it, the relationship with the Senate is really crucial. Another key aspect is that Augustus didn't have a son of his own. And in the patriarchal society of the Roman world, that is difficult. The line of succession the bloodline of the imperial family goes through his daughter, Julia, his sister, Octavia, and his third wife, Livia, uh, who is there next to him. And this is, this is, as you probably gathered, is an installation shot from the exhibition. That means that these Julio-Claudian women are really very important. They're very prominent in public life. Um, they have great influence. And that's resented also in Roman society particularly by the elite. So there are lots of, of ingrained conflicts there already, and they come to the fore during Nero's reign. Next slide, please. The transition from Claudius 
to Nero was extremely well managed. Nero was really built up for many years as a crown prince. He was extremely well tutored. He was given moments in, in the limelight. Um, he gave games, he gave speeches in the Senate. He was preferred over Claudius's own natural son, Britannicus, who was two, three years younger, probably too young, really, to, to be considered a, a, a potential successor. When Claudius died, everything went very smooth, smoothly. You see here on the right a relief, I chose uh, members of the Praetorian Guard, and they were ready and on site, and a speech had been prepared, and this was really a very welcome new reign. Here was a descendant of Augustus, young, vigorous, a huge contrast to Claudius, uh, good looking by the standards of the time. Here's the same portrait we used um, for the poster. It, this is the same type uh, you saw earlier as a boy, but more mature. And he's slightly turned, um, really a lot of dynamism. He's supposed to be the new Augustus. In poetry, what we have left of it, he's compared to Apollo. Um, Nero Pandley was also some shade of blonde, so like Apollo. He's also compared to Mars, the god of war. It's a very different notion of this ruler we get. So young, vigorous, um, this is the beginning of a new golden age. The Praetorians are there in the background, and just, um, just by the way, another relief from the Louvre, that comes from the triumphal arch in Rome, uh, erected for Claudius' uh, conquest of Britain 11 years earlier. If we move on. Agrippina, Nero's mother, was extremely important for the transition. She become very prominent under Claudius already. He probably married her to show up his own position. She was Augustus's great granddaughter after all, and the daughter of Germanicus, one of the great heroes and intended successors. And there's this fantastic statue from, from Rome, from the Capitolini. Um, looks like bronze, but is carved from an exotic Egyptian heartstone. So an amazing artwork in its own right. And the exhibition is full of these as well. And a fantastic series of coins that talks about Agrippina's status. She was almost a co-ruler, almost a regent for Nero. Um, the first on the left is the back and front of a silver coin uh, struck under Claudius still. And quite remarkably, Agrippina's portrait is on the front. She's very prominent. That tells us a lot about her status. And Nero, her son, the Grand Prince, is on the back. Then the, the Arias, the gold coin on the top right, um, is just after Nero had taken over. But Agrippina is there with him on front. And her titles, not Nero's, are there. Nero's are on the back. So that tells you something about her status. Uh, and then the next one, they're side by side. And Nero's titles are there. And a few months later, Agrippina slowly disappears and is not on the coinage anymore. And that tells us about the conflicts at court and how she's slowly relegated to the sidelines. Next slide, please. The next big section in the exhibition we've called War and Diplomacy. And it's not something you'd normally associate with Nero and his reign. You know, you expect something about him as an artist and performer. But war and diplomacy really is crucial throughout his reign. He inherited big conflicts from his predecessor. There was a conflict with the Parthians, that big rival power. In any sense, Rome's equal, in some ways even superior in the east, greater Iran. Uh, and there was the Boudicca rebellion in Britain. We mentioned it already. Britain only conquered 11 years before. And there are these great objects here on the right, uh, one of the icons of the British Museum collection. It's a, it's a bronze head of Nero, still sometimes called Claudius, it's Nero. That was probably ripped off a statue in Colchester, the Roman capital at the time during the Boudicca rebellion. Britain really gives us a local ground up picture of what happens, what the reality of Roman imperialism really means. The, the, the core part of the province had only just been handed over to civilian administration. All around was the military frontier and then a resource rich tribal belt. Uh, and there was still warfare. There was an ambitious governor eager for glory and booty who wanted to extend the province outwards. And the locals were treated with great disrespect. It was a province swarming with soldiers, with military contractors, with tax farmers and so on. So no wonder that it came to a rebellion. Um, rebels or freedom fighters, whatever you want to call them. 
it's an interesting little statuette, uh, and I remember that comes from Venice. Uh, I remember us holding it there in our hands and have a photo of Francesca cradling it fondly. It's now in the exhibition. That's so important because it gives us a, a full length Nero. So, you know, probably our bronze head would have looked uh, like that on a complete statue. Um, and he's in military armor. So the Nero of Nero's day was the chief magistrate in the toga, toga or the commanding general in military gear. He wasn't the, uh, the, the, the liar player or artist at all. So we have to reconstruct that. Next slide, please. And this is just to give you a flavor of what we have in the exhibition. Um, th there's an awful lot of new research and they're fantastic new finds as well that we can show in the exhibition for the first time in context. Um, one object I, I find incredibly powerful is this gang chain on the left, which comes from Anglesey. It was used to chain together five prisoners, captives, maybe even Roman prisoners of war. It tells us a lot about the reality of life in the province. On the top, you have the so-called Fennec Horter. That was found during rescue excavations in Colchester in 2014. It's probably the personal jewellery and belongings of a Roman veteran settler couple. Uh, they buried it in haste as the rebels approached or, or the Iceni under Boudicca approached and they didn't live to retrieve these treasures. On the bottom we have uh, so-called Bloomberg tablets. They're writing tablets discovered between 2009 and 13 in the city of La London. The earliest documents of, of Latin, uh, the earliest evidence of Latin handwriting in Britain. And they, they are of the Neronian period and they talk about the prosperity of London before the rebellion and the quick rebuilding of London which like Colchester and Berlinium had been completely destroyed. Um, Nero considered giving up the province he decided against but rebuilt it. He recalled that ambitious uh, governor uh, and replaced some of the top officials. There's a lot about the right form of government so the new people who come in of provincial background and they're probably more lenient. Uh, and that's quite significant. Um, these are all things hated by the traditional elite. We know, and I'll come to an end very quickly, we know there were many impeachment trials at the same period. Uh, corrupt governors uh, being put on trial in front of the Senate in Rome. Um, for Britain that probably wasn't the right moment, but it gives you some context uh, of the Neronian period and the politics behind this all. The next slide, and I think that will be my final slide, is about war with the Parthians. Um, so that was conflict uh, over the buffer state of Armenia in the Caucasus. Um, there were initial su successes, a Roman army went there, conquered the Armenian capital, um, then set back. Um, there's an evocation of this triumphal arch, which you always also see on the coin there. And we have some original fragments in the exhibition and the coin portrait of the, uh, of the Parthian great king, Vologasis. That's uh, Nero's opposite number. And the amazing thing that happens is that they, well, by necessity in a way, but they, they agree ultimately a diplomatic solution whereby Nero uh, accepts a Parthian prince as the new Armenian king. But the deal is that this Parthian prince will come to Rome and will be, be crowned by Nero in Rome. So for Nero, this is a tremendous PR success. And you know, from some of the, the, the finds from the eastern provinces, this was of huge significance throughout the empire. So. Nero had this, this image as a good military leader and successful diplomat and that contrasts with what we think about him as well. And at this stage um, I'll hand over to Francesca who continues the, the narrative run through. Thank you Thorsten and thank you for the next slide. And so we now move from a conflict at the borders of the empire so to, to inner conflicts, inner, inner conflicts within Roman society in a way. So this statue here uh, comes from Rome and it, it represents a, a lanternario, so a, a slave boy whose job was to uh, light the way for his master holding his lantern. And here the boy has fallen asleep while waiting dutifully for his master. And this is a very, in, uh, this is a, a extremely beautiful piece coming from Rome, but it is a very unrealistic representation of what slavery was actually like. And the reality of uh, slavery uh, was extremely different and Roman society was uh, deeply uh, divided. And there is a uh, anecdote that we have from uh, Nero's reign that is quite uh, telling. And around the time of Boudicca's revolt in AD 61 in Rome, the prefect of the city 
uh, was uh, killed uh, by one of his slaves. Uh, the Senate uh, on this occasion decided to uphold a existing law according to which all enslaved members of the household were to be executed for the crime of but one of them. Uh, the people protested and However, in this specific occasion, uh, uh, Nero decided uh, to back the, the Senate. Although it is important to notice that when the, the Senate actually started thinking about further punishment, uh, which would also uh, uh, hit the uh, freed uh, member of the, uh, of the household, uh, Nero vetoed this further uh, cruelty. And if we move to the, to the next slide, and so, uh, as we said, on this occasion, uh, Nero decided to, to, to side with the Senate. However, we do have proof uh, that uh, of, his, uh, concern, of his deep concern for the well-being of the people, especially those of Rome. Uh, if we do turn to the building projects he completed in Rome, we do see that he built as was expected of emperors at the time, really, but uh, uh, it did so with uh, great enthusiasm, if we can use this word. Uh, it did build uh, amenities uh, for the welfare and entertainment of the people. Unfortunately, these buildings are now lost to us, but we do have uh, accounts and description of them, and in some cases, as you can see here, we do ha we have them. Uh, uh, depicted on, on coins of great quality. So here, uh, uh, Nero was uh, very aware of how important it was to maintain the food supply of the capital. And here you can see uh, on the left the arbor of Ostia, which had been uh, completed, uh, of, uh, sorry, of Fortus near Ostia, which had been completed by Claudius. What Nero did was to improve the connection between this harbour and the capital and uh, associated with this he also built a grand uh, covert market, the Macello Magnum, which you can see represented on the coin on the right instead. Uh, on top of this we also know that he built uh, grandiose baths and, and a wooden amphitheatre when uh, gladiatorial fights and hands could be organized for the entertainment of the people. And uh, if we please go to the next slide. So uh, entertainment games or, or ludi in Latin were extremely important for Roman society. So political leaders could gain incredible uh, popular support by organizing uh, these games. And during the Republic, uh, there is the practice uh, competing among each other to organize such games, uh, but with this new political system, it became the prerogative of the emperor to organize them. And this is, was not just about entertainment, these events were highly politicized. So the seating arrangement was based on uh, social order, uh, the performances uh, because we're not just talking about, as you can see here, gladiatorial games and, and chariot racing, there were also theatrical performances. So these performances sometimes ended, not necessarily too subtly, at ongoing political events. And the audience could appeal directly to the emperor if he was in attendance and, and so on. So we already get uh, quite an interesting picture. Uh, if you turn to the next slide, please. So Nero, famously, was the first emperor to perform on stage. Um, this is described as something absolutely uh, scandalous, uh, caused it only by Nero's own vanity. He's, uh, uh, he's just described as a narcissistic, uh, deluded artist. However, if, if we consider what I just said, there are two elements that we should consider when uh, were assessing uh, I'm trying to understand why Nero decided to appear on stage. And one element is uh, political and the other is more um, cultural. So by, uh, as I said before, these events, these games, uh, these performances were highly politicized. So by appearing on stage, Nero could actually 
uh, steer the political discourse, it could steer the uh, reaction of the audience, and it did so thanks to the Augustiani, so a professional clack that would be among the, uh, the audience when you performed. And this is the political aspect. The cultural aspect is that actually uh, the, the fact that Nero decided to appear on stage was part of a bigger cultural shift. It was, uh, it was not the first one, actually. Well before Nero, men and women of the elite uh, performed on stage or fought in the arena's gladiators. So uh, this was harshly criticized by traditionalists. But uh, again, uh, what Nero does is just part of this cultural shift that was happening at the time and had been happening for quite a while. And the, the coin you see on the right here uh, is quite telling uh, because it um, it represents Apollo, is a coin minted under Nero, represents the god Apollo, and however, according to Suetonius, uh, this is not Apollo, but Nero depicting himself as Apollo, uh, which is not the case, <laughs> as you can see in the exhibition, as we have the image magnified. And, and, but uh, we decided to put it here because this is quite telling of how sometimes it's not about what things really are, but about how they, they looked. And so it's, this is a good example of how images and history uh, and stories can be manipulated in order to change perception. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. And uh, this section, Passion and Discord of the exhibition, is essentially about uh, the women in Nero's life. And we decided to put them all together in one section because actually uh, how uh, Nero's interaction with, with these women are described in ancient sources is quite uh, telling about history can be fabricated and manipulated. So starting from the top, uh, most famously, uh, Nero killed his mother Agrippina. So we're not here to say not it was innocent. This is not the point. But if you do read the accounts, you do realize uh, about his, her death, you do realize they are quite far-fetched. They involve a collapsible boat and every possible <laughs> The, a device of uh, uh, an, an, an odd story and not only they are far-fetched but if you read them carefully you can see how they borrow quite heavily uh, from drama so you literally see how lines from tragedies became uh, lines on history books basically and if you then move uh, to uh, Claudia Octavia, of which you can see a possible portrait uh, on the left of the slide. So Claudia Octavia was Nero's first wife. And again, the story about uh, her death is just too perfect. So Claudia Octavia is the perfect, dutiful wife. Popea is the, the devious uh, mistress. And, and Nero is just a puppet in her hand. He convinced him to banish and, and, uh, and then have Octavia executed. The story is just so perfect that it's basically a cliche. So it makes you wonder, can you can we really just believe it? And, and lastly, uh, Popea, uh, which we have on the right, uh, sources tell us that Nero loved her. However, uh, he kicked her to death when she was pregnant. And again, even here, it is a, a motive of uh, the, 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 the crazy uh, monarch kicking his wife to death, it's actually something that appears over and over again in literature. So something that we should challenge when we see it uh, connected with, uh, with Nero. We now go to the next slide, please. And so the fire, the great fire of Rome. This is uh, to us what defines uh, Nero's reign and legacy to this day. So the street fire of Rome started by the Circus Maximus on the night of the 15th of July, the 64, lasted no less than nine days and essentially destroyed the city uh, of Rome. Uh, Nero was not even in Rome at the time. He was in, in Antium, so about 50 kilometers away from, uh, from Rome. And however, he rushed back to the capital and led the relief efforts. And however, uh, when the fire abated, he blamed and persecuted uh, the Christians for it, which uh, very likely pl played an important role in how his, uh, uh, his image was later very uh, negatively uh, depicted. And 
Nero uh, rebuilt the city, introduced new building regulation, which improved the living quarters, and, however, most famously, built himself a amazing new palace, the Domus Area, which we can see in the next slide. And um, so the Domus Area, the Golden House, uh, this palace was described by uh, ancient old style sources as the palace of the residence of, of a tyrant, the epitome of decadent luxury, and Autos like Pliny and, and Marshall uh, said how the palace encircled the whole capital. And, and indeed, this was a, a great uh, palace, which buildings spread on both the Palatine Hill and the Esquiline uh, Hill, connected by porticos and Colonnade Square. It even had a, a vast artificial uh, pool. It, it was decorated with incredible marbles and fresco. Um, however, uh, it is important uh, to, uh, to note that uh, despite, uh, I mean, of course, it was, this palace was a great uh, backdrop for, uh, for Nero's uh, public events and for, for the entertainments he offered to the court and the senators. However, part of this palace were very likely accessible to the people, so this was not just a private residence that encompassed the whole of the city as it has been uh, described. Now, go to the next slide. So, as Tosin said at the beginning, this was a period of great uh, prosperity and great wealth, which in turn led to conspicuous and competitive uh, consumption amongst the members of the elite. So this became a, a marker of social status. So here you see some example of uh, luxury, so from a, a fresco showing uh, elite villa architecture, which uh, by the way, uh, these uh, aristocratic villas were not so far removed from what the Domus Harrier near Nero's palace must have looked like. They were just built on a different scale. Uh, so, uh, fresco showing a, a villa by the seaside. A, uh, in the lower uh, left, you see a famous uh, marine cup. So, this uh, Baza Marina, of which we read in the sources, were extremely uh, costly uh, vessel made of precious stone that came from the east. And on the uh, lower right, instead, you see some uh, silverware that was found near Pompeii. Uh, however, quite interestingly, this, uh, this, this, this silverware did not actually, from the context, we know that it did not be, uh, belong to a member of the aristocracy, but it belonged to uh, wealthy uh, freedmen that were active in the area. And this, it, it, and this is evidence of how this uh, luxurious lifestyle uh, started spreading to the newly rich, which in turn caused social anxiety among the members of the uh, elite. If we now go to the next slide. So we know we have an, uh, this idea of Nero has a hated uh, tyrant. That's the picture we got from the sources. However, uh, we do have archaeological evidence of uh, how popular it must have been among the people. So here you see some graffiti coming, uh, the doodle you can see on the left comes from, from Rome, is a, a doodle of Nero coming from the Palatine. On the right you have instead graffiti uh, from Pompeii, one is, uh, is a uh, uh, Pompeii, uh, is a graffito naming Nero and his wife Pompeia. The second one is a poem uh, that uh, tells us about the offerings that Nero and uh, um, Pompeia made to the Temple of Venus in Pompeii. So these evidence, together with other things you will see in the exhibition, uh, prove that Nero was actually popular. So they tell us the other side of the story. They, they show us the voices of the Roman people. And we've now turned to the last slide. Um, well, Nero's story comes to a almost abrupt uh, end. So after the, uh, well, throughout his reign, he had to uh, deal with a number of uh, conspiracies, just like any other uh, emperor, really, Nero was not special from this point of view. The turning point is the Pisonian conspiracy of AD uh, 65. The plot is discovered, the conspiracy, Theaters are executed or forced to commit suicide, and famously among them are 
the philosopher Seneca, as well as the famous writer Petronius. And Nero in then uh, lived for a tour of Greece, possibly the first step of his campaign in the East, but is forced to rush back to Rome due to a rebellion of the governor of uh, Golvindet and then of Galba at the time, the governor of Spain. Uh, it is at this point that uh, the Senate declares Nero the uh, enemy of the state and he first tried to, uh, to flee from Rome, but then uh, is, is essentially forced to commit suicide on the 9th of June, 1868. And after his death, uh, we have a 18 month of civil war, the so-called year of the four emperors. And at last, uh, uh, Flav uh, the, uh, we have a new dynasty coming to power, the Flavians, uh, starting with uh, Vespasian, a former general of uh, Nero. And that uh, is the end of our story. Francesca, Francesca, thank you so much. And Torsten, what, what, you know, how rich and how brilliant to see these myths and legends not always being punctured, but being mollified and nuanced. And, and the questions are coming in thick and fast. I've just got one for you before uh, we get the, the questions from the public. Uh, this is a very eagerly awaited and long awaited exhibition. Actually, only six months late, which is pretty spectacular given what we've all been through. Why for you was it the right time to mount this exhibition? Was it because of uh, the availability of, of some of this extraordinary new archaeology like the Fennec Horde for instance or was it just because it felt like it was the right time to reevaluate re the man? So was it led by uh, objects and archaeology or by uh, his history? I mean I would say both. Tosten do you want to start or I think you're muting, so I, I'm going to start then. <laughs> so I, I, I while well, you're still mute himself. So I would say both, because of course, this is an exhibition that would have been completely different 20 or 30 years ago. There have been some ex excellent new discoveries in this country. And, and that's why uh, the section about Roman Britain is actually one of our favorites uh, in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and not just in, in the UK, even in, uh, in Rome, there have been new excavations that allow us to understand better the, for example, the, the spread of the fire of Rome and so on. So there is new discovery. There are new discoveries, but also, um, well, really, uh, what uh, comes from the story of Nero is uh, mostly about how we should approach um, historical accounts but more widely we could see info, we could say information and that is uh i feel quite relevant always but of course at times like these it has become possibly even more uh relevant than at uh, other times um and this is also which is stunning the first uh exhibition on on near in the uk and considering that the connection the local connection the buddhic revolt and so on it this is just uh, it's incredible so it was a good time i would say it is remarkable that isn't it and uh, thinking about Boudicca as you say she holds kind of such an important place in the British psyche there are lots of myths and legends about her as well but what do you both think Nero thought of the Boudicca event and what was going on in Britain you know how, were we just kind of right at the edges and the kind of fringes of his consciousness or do you think that, that there was an opinion that he held? That's a super interesting question um uh, we don't know, I mean, because the, the historic Boudicca and the one, the Boudicca we get in the literary sources are obviously completely different. Um, Tacitus and others create this, this um, anti-type to the Roman elite whip, um, but, but again, his is a, a very manly, uh, you know, and that's a negative stereotype, obviously, in the, in the Roman psyche. Um, uh, leader. Um, but very energetic and she, you know she's the the antagonist or, or the equivalent to Agrippina for example I think Nero was mostly devastated and disappointed with his official I mean it's this you know there's a lot of conflict senators and senatorial commanders um, didn't have the possibilities open to them in the republic anymore so fewer opportunities for conflict and Britain was one of the few provinces where that could be done and they went over the top uh, and, I, and, and, you know, it was really devastating. I mean, the, the losses were enormous. And I think it took Nero a long time to make up 
for that. And then many reforms, um, whether it was Nero himself, or he had a good hand in choosing clever advisors, there are currency reforms, there are tax reforms, there are really attempts to hold officials accountable and so on. So I think a lot of the focus of his paper was on these aspects. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And actually, there was an early question from um, Lynn Jensen, who was asking about his advisors. D do we know if there was one particular person who, upon whom he depended? And if so, what was their political agenda? So how driven do you think Nero was by the men around him? And women. And women. I mean, we know from the, uh, at the beginning, especially Agrippina played, I, I mean, at least the sources tell us that she played a very important role. I mean, I, I think, uh, maybe it doesn't want, want, uh, then get into far too detail, but I think something we need to, to state quite clearly from the start is, is that these are absolutely it, tremendously interesting answer for which we might never, a uh, question for which we might never have an answer, because really what we have, which is our issue with Nero, but not only Nero, is that we have only sources that are presenting a very specific angle. So. It sometimes it's quite different to uh, understand the motives of the people whose lives we read about. For example, we have, let's take Seneca. Seneca was Nero's tutor and he became one of his advisors. And we have historians writing about him that very clearly uh, uh, use sources that were sometimes in favor of Seneca and sometimes against Seneca. So we have some picture of Seneca as this uh, stoic philosopher that was just trying to basically uh, guide Nero in the best possible uh, uh, way. And then we have other sources that present him um, in uh, quite a different way. And we can see how the, the histories that survive sometimes speak one side and sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, the other. For example, uh, it was, Nero was a stoic, yes, and uh, we do know that one of the possible causes of Pudica's revolt were the fact that Seneca, among others, had uh, we, we drew quite suddenly some big loans that they did to, uh, to, the, to members of the uh, local elite. So that's not really sort of stoic philosopher you, you would uh, imagine. Tosin, uh, if you wanna... No, that's exactly it. Seneca is one of the big names there's Boros, his partner in, in, in crime, if you like, or in leadership, the commander of the Praetorian Guard. And there, there is a hint in the sources that there was conflict. There's different traditions. There was definitely a tradition that blamed Seneca's for lots of the bad things. He, he was Nero's tutor, became his chief advisor and minister, and became enormously wealthy. It's quite quirky. We have a cast of his only surviving portrait from antiquity in the exhibition that was found in, the, in 1812 or thereabouts. And for centuries, a very different portrait type had been identified as Seneca because he's this stoic saint and it gets us to the, the whole the motivation behind the conspirators and so on. There's, a, there's an emaciated philosophical looking man and then popped out this name portrait. It was a rather well fed person who clearly enjoyed the luxuries of life. So as Seneca became sanctified, Nero became vilified. There's opposing poles, and and the tradition then gets streamlined where Nero is just evil, and Seneca is is the antipode. And lots of people saying how fascinating they're finding it uh, that he was genuinely popular. Um, Andrew Vincenti is asking though, in terms of graffiti or graffito, is there just one that survives that says he's marvelous, or actually are there quite a few graffiti uh, praising Nero? I mean, we from recent research, it appears that his name is the one that appears the most often in Pompeii. Let's keep in mind that Pompeii was actually destroyed uh, by the eruption of Ponte Vesuvius about 11 years after Nero's death. So we have all the Julio Claudius before Nero, then we have Nero, then we have the first Flavians, and still, what we would expect if he was such a master, the name of Vespasian or Titus would be the most common in Pompeii, but actually it's it's Nero, which is quite telling. It's just his name and, and uh, often would prepare us everywhere, some of them clearly praising him. And I, I, I think possibly the poem that we had in one of the side is the most uh, uh, interesting and telling, but really we got uh, many graffiti from Pompeii that uh, hail Nero. Mm -hmm. And he was, of course, famous in Pompeii for helping to re-establish the, the games after they'd been cancelled. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it might seem so. It, uh, 
probably the the, the the best connection was through Popea because Popea's family had properties in the area so that would of course and his name and often appears next to her so I I, I feel like uh, since it, it's a bit contested whether or not it, it stopped the ban on the games uh, I feel definitely uh, the Pompeii link was uh, very strongly felt by uh, people in uh, in Pompeii and in the Vesuvian area. A number of people are asking, he does seem to have, uh, to put it politely, a conflicted relationship with women, uh, as far as we can tell from the historical sources. Be really interested to hear from you both. It's very difficult, obviously, to get into the minds of the ancients and to understand them psychologically. But if we were to try to, and, you know, for you to, you've immersed yourself in Nero's life. Francesca and Torsten, what do you think Nero's relationship was with women? This is a question that's coming in from, from all corners of the world. It's a good question too. I mean, it, Nero's legacy is, is a lot is about about his relationship with the women around him, and you could psychologize this. I mean, his own mother Agrippina was sent into exile uh, uh, when he was uh, about a year or year and a half old. Um, so you know, he grew up without her for for a period. Um, his father died when he was three. So there's perhaps some sort of estrangement there. But then again, I think it's probably more interesting that that's quite typical for the Roman elite. Um, one of the of the touching objects in the exhibition is the tombstone of Nero's wet nurse, mm. um, Claudia Ecloge, and and we know from the reports of his death that he was then buried by his first love, a freed woman, Claudia Acte, and his two wet nurses. So there's that, but there's a lot of evidence that he was really in love with his second wife, Popea, uh, and what. The, the key thing for Nero is that the surviving literary accounts are uniformly biased against him. They follow rhetorical patterns and they're from A to Z, they're negative. They're black and white. There's no objective layer with a few rhetorical flourishes on top. They're trying to assassinate, assassinate Nero's character. And his relationship with his women is part of that. The women are not liked either, uh, as we said at the outset, because they're so prominent during the Julio-Claudian period. Um, most of these authors in modern terms are, are misogynistic. I mean, re re really no doubt about that. All the wives uh, uh, and the princesses, they're adulteresses, they're, they're incestuous and so on. And these are all just political slogans. That's to, to, to take them down a peg, really. What do you think, Francesco? If you if you can try to find your way, fight your way through these misogynist sources, what's your yeah? I, I feel like we really when when we are trying to we have a problem with trying to uh, find the hidden Nero, if you wanna <laughs> if you wanna use them, and we have an even bigger problem trying to find out about his relationship with women because we basically meet a double bias. We have the bias against women that we do see in historical sources and then we have the bias against Nero so it's really it's a double bias that makes it I feel almost in, impossible to find out what's the reality of it. Yeah and if I, if, I, if I just may one thing I think throughout the exhibition the exciting thing or, or I think the important thing is to to get away from Nero the person in that sense as an exception and look at the, at the underlying patterns of Roman society and how much how much what, what Nero does or doesn't do is, is part of a wider trend. I think we can use Nero as a way into that and, and really look at the tensions and conflicts within society and the prejudices and the, the gender relationships and so on. One of the first questions that came in was uh, a question about the Republic, that do either of you think after his death there was a chance that the Republic could be re-established in, in Rome or is that extremely unlikely? That, that was the rhetoric, I'm sure Francesca The moment agreed. was gone. Um, there were moments, I mean, the senatorial class had made its peace with the principate because that kept the peace. They, they knew one person probably should be in charge. They didn't want, so monarchy is, is okay in some form, but not hereditary. Um, you know, we always use this analogy, the, 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 the cardinals in the Catholic Church. Every cardinal in theory could be Pope. So every senator probably thought, in an ideal world, you know, he, he could become emperor. And um, just uh, after the assassination of Caligula, they had a debate in the Senate. Various candidates among the senators came to the fore uh, and, you know, they were even trying to, to start an election. But by that time, Claudius had bribed the Praetorians and they, they put him on the throne and that was the end of the matter. And that is a repeated pattern, really. 
Uh, Gavin Ramsden asked again early about the court and the legal system, and he was very, very really interesting what you were saying. How regular were Freeman appeals uh, in in the court? And sort of, can you just paint a picture of those? I mean, what you know, what what did that what did those courtrooms look like? Did you mean the impeachment trials in particular, or? or? I, I think just generally, yes, I, I think impeachment trials, but also um, regular uh, appeals uh, for, from Freemans. But, but the impeachment trials, that, that's great because you've been talking about those. I mean, these in particular peaked under Nero, their studies. Um, uh, they, the, 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 the quantity increases during Nero's reign. So that says something about trying to reform certain things. I mean, you know, all, the, the empire isn't that old or, or the principate as an institution is 80 years old. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that needs to be sorted out and fall into place. And Nero is a member of a new generation. He's already grown up with some of these changes, absorbed them. But it's an empire of, I don't know, at that time, 40, 50, maybe 60 million people. The elite, the sen senators, are 600 of the old nobility with very old-fashioned traditional views, and there's tension in there. The emperor is, is personally hugely involved in the legal system, of course. Again, a lot of people asking, there's an anonymous question from Brazil. Why is it that we love to use Nero to measure up to our contemporary politicians? So there's been, there have been comparisons with Bolsonaro, with Trump, with our own Boris. A question to both of you on the panel. Do you think this is valid? And, and are there any comparisons between uh, the, these, these big characters of contemporary politics and the ancient character of Nero? Francesca? I... I mean, I'm always a bit aware about uh, making this comparison. I feel like the reason why with Nero and historical characters like him is so easy is that they have reached the point where they're not even people anymore. They're just ideas of, in this case, the mad tyrant or the, the incompetent politician, which is completely taken by some other pointless pursuit. I, yeah, I, I think the, the reason why the shoes fit and it's just so wide, <laughs> basically, that uh, it can be used and, and, and reused. And yeah, I still wonder why Nero got, it became so popular. I, I, I got the feeling, talking with some friends as well, that might be something that has to do with the English speaking world rather than any other country. That might, might be my bias. So I don't know, Torsten, if, if what you think. Well, we have the fiddling while Rome burns is, is a classic. I mean, that's a metaphor used all the time. I, I, I think Francesca is right. Nero is this larger, but it's only the Nero in the sources, okay? It's not probably the real historic Nero, but the, the Nero we've come to believe in is larger than life. He's vain, he's, he's arrogant and what. So everything we hate in our politicians, we can project onto him. But, you know, it's an artificial Nero. A very interesting question from Iran Barry, who says, is Nero getting up on stage the equivalent of politicians today reaching out directly to their followers on Twitter? I, so, it, what do you think? I like the comparison, really, yes. Yeah. I, I, he will be a, a social media guy these days. Mm. Yes, I, I can see him, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say as well. I mean, reaching out to the public directly in the theatre or in the circus is exactly the equivalent to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we talk rather blithely about his death and the fact that it was a suicide. And it's just one of those things that gets sort of slightly trotted out, you know, on the pages of history. A uh, question to both of you, what, what significance was that? I mean, is it something which is considered a weak way to die? Or is there a sense of it, you're taking control of your death and, and it's a beautiful death? Maybe Thorson first and then Francesca. It's, it's a really good point. I mean, it was an honourable death. That's what you're supposed to do. Roman society, especially for the elite, is all about dignity and maintaining your dignity. So suicide is one way of controlling that as an individual. It's an age also of anxiety. I mean, this is a stressed society. There are generational conflicts. There, there are all these newly rich people. You know, if, if you're a senator's son, maintaining your status is extremely difficult. You're up against a lot of competition. So Nero's suicide is not unusual. It's interesting how it's described that he's surrounded only again by former slaves, that he cannot even do it himself. You know, someone else has to help him push the dagger in. And that contrasts. Um, th there's a new genre of biographies uh, after Nero's death, and it's the, the lives and deaths 
of those exiles and killed by Nero, for example. And they're all these Stoics. They're all these, you know, take calmly, take their lives and, and talk about philosophy and what. It's all artificial contrast. So Nero is, again, is the, the bad example. And these are the good guys. Also remember, um, Trajan, uh, the emperor under whom Tacitus writes and, and possibly Suetonius, is the great nephew of, of one of these uh, conspirators who are put to death under Nero, forced to commit suicide. So there's a direct link there as well. Francesca? Yeah, no, um, I mean, as Totten said, the whole point was if you, when you had no other option, uh, suicide was the honorable death. And I always found fascinating how they even took that away from him. So he, he took what was for the time the honorable way out, as in, rather than them fleeing, and since he could not fight anymore, he decided to take his own life. That's just, in theory, that's the most honorable thing he could do. But they had to represent him unable to even make that final act. He needs a freedman, I mean, not a member of the elite, a, a, a freedman to help him push the dagger in his neck. So they even took the, that last bit of dignity from him. I think that's quite, that's quite interesting, quite telling also. And after he died, I know there was a rash of fake Neros, of people pretending to be Nero or claiming to be Nero. And again, a very interesting question from Michael Forson. He said, apart from the ancient fake Neros, what about the modern fake Neros? What do you two think in terms of how he's been represented on film? Who is your, who is your favourite silver screen or small screen Nero? <laughs> well, or shall I take it first? I, I, I think the Ustinov still, Ustinov is, is great. I mean, he looks, he looks like that Capitolini portrait. He's so believable. That's why these sources are so convincing. That's why it's taken us 2,000 years to, to question them so hard, because they're fascinating and you can impersonate them. And, you know, Baroque opera to, to Hollywood movies, it's all there. I, Claudius, Claudius the God, all these novels and the film adaptations, they're brilliant. Francesca? No, no yeah, I, I guess Usti will not fit. It will always be a favorite. It's interesting how these fake Neros in antiquity uh, had a mass following, as in in a positive way, whereas these fake Neros now we are discussing the, the more recent one. People like them, but I mean, <laughs> basically they, they love to hate them. See, it's just a different approach, I guess. I guess all the negatives have been digested at this point. But still, the, 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 the anecdote, the histories, the, the, the madness, they're just, just, they're just, I mean, you really, I mean, they get to you, right? They do, they do. We're actually at the end of our time, tragically, uh, I know, and there are still more questions coming in. A last question to both of you. Um, in terms of this exhibition, is there a curator's choice object? Is there one that you secretly, that you can confess to us tonight, that you secretly love above all the others? Depends on the day. <laughs> I have to say, like I, we have received these questions many times, and I feel like every time we, we give a different reply. So Tosten, what's your favorite photo yeah, of I the day? Like choosing one among your children, you know? Um, I, I think generally, though, our choices change, but it's not it's not the gleaming marble statues. It's the it's the graffiti. It's the slave chains. It's a it's the things we don't normally see that tell us a different story and it give us a different angle. And they're very touching because, you know, you could feel the slave chain around your own neck or you can look at the little slave boy. I think I think they're probably for me or for us. They're probably the best, most evocative objects in the exhibition. Mm. And I think I have to say one of the most remarkable objects that I've never seen up close is a was a mirror compact with the face of Nero on. So, I mean, it's just extraordinary, close on 2000 years old, and that could be in anybody's bag today. So, you know, remarkable treasures, as you said, um, moving items, mind opening, eye opening items from the, the great and the monumental to the very small. So I'm afraid that's it. We have to we have to stop. But thank you so much, both of you. You know, what what total fascination and well done. Kudos to you for getting this through in this, this very, very difficult time as well. As I said, there are close on 2000 people with us tonight. I'm not sure if they're all be able to make it to the exhibition. I know it opened to the public today. 7000 have booked their tickets so far. But if you if you can make it and you can stay safe, please, please do come to the exhibition at the British Museum. Um, and also, if you can't, 
join us for more online events. There are many planned uh, throughout the autumn and there are about 140 questions unanswered. So Francesca and Thorson, we might be able to have to come back and, and have a rematch with more of those questions from the public. But thank you so, so much for, for giving up your evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to the British Museum and thank you everybody from around the world for joining us this evening for a, for a night in with Nero. Thank you.